Amen. That uh, heralds the trumpets having been returned to the <laughs> sanctuary and the full completion of the window. That was the last thing. So yes, give yourself a big hand. We did it. We did it. We paid for it. And uh, it's a great celebration, so thank you, Elizabeth. Well, good morning. I am Ramona Lynn Bethley, lead pastor here at First United Methodist Church of Alexandria, and it is a joy for me to welcome you here this day. I want to invite you, if you haven't done so already, to please sign in on the black registration pads. They're the binders to the inside of each aisle. If you will fill that out, pass it to your neighbor, and then if someone should slip in uh, beside you, near you, behind you, uh, help them register their attendance as well. It's a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. We get to celebrate a baptism, and uh, so I want to invite the, any children that are in the back to come up forward uh, if, if your parents will allow so you get a front row seat uh, to this baptism this morning. So today we were, are embarking on a new sermon series called Small Steps, Big Journey. And today we're going to look at Heart Over Habit. There's a story of a church in Denmark that when they entered the sanctuary, they, there was a wall, and they would all bow to the wall. Now, it was just a blank wall. Uh, for centuries, they would just bow to the wall. No one really could remember why they bowed to the wall. They just knew that it had always, we've always done it that way. You walk into the sanctuary, you bow to the wall. Well, one day, they just they were doing a renovation, and as they began to chip away paint and plaster, they found an image, a sculpture of Jesus behind that wall. And even though they did not remember why they bowed to it, they, they were amazed to find out, oh, this must be why people came in and bowed here, because there is an image of Jesus here. Well, the important thing is not habit, but heart when it comes to our worship, and we're going to explore that today as we embark on this big journey, taking one small step at a time. So as we begin this time of worship, let us pray. Lord, as we gather here this morning, may it be out of love for you and not out of habit. Fill us with your Spirit that will lead us into a deep, loving relationship with you. A relationship that will change everything. How we live, how we give, how we worship, and how we see and treat others. This is truly our prayer, O oh Lord. Amen. I invite you now, if you are able, to please stand and we will join together in our call to worship that you will find in your bulletin this morning. Every act of giving is a tribute to God's love for us. Lord, prepare us to be generous people. Every act of service is a tribute to our love for God. Lord, prepare us to be loving people. Keep your hearts and spirits ready to serve the Lord. Lord, prepare us to hear your word and to respond by how we love live and give. Amen. Our hymn of praise this morning is found in your red hymnals. It's hymn number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, some of flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, 
And now as one body, let us affirm our faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. seated, I would invite the Hill family to come forward as we celebrate in the sacrament of baptism. I'll take the baby. Oh, I get the baby. Hello. We'll turn you where you can see your family. Yeah, look at all them so they can see you too. Here comes Harriet. Well, baptism is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. It is a sign of God's love that is with your child even before she is old enough to understand that and recognize that love for herself. Jesus knew the importance of bringing children into the community of faith and said, Hinder them not, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And when we baptize a child or anybody, we are marking them as a Christian disciple. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. That's right. That's right. That's exactly what we're doing. And we are initiating them into the family of God. And so it is no, uh, it is important as you present your child for baptism, we're going to ask, we're going to ask them three questions. You ready? Okay. Number one, do you profess your own, oh, do you profess your own faith? That's okay. It's all good. This is not my first rodeo. Do you profess your own faith in Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior? Okay, you ready for question number two? (laughs) I know it's a hard one. Will you live before this child a life that becomes the gospel? That means that you will share with her, you will share with her the scriptures and stories of the Bible, that you will pray for her and with her, and that you will... uh, Keep her under, yeah, there we go. And that you will give reverent attendance to both private and public worship. We will. And then will you keep her under the ministry of the church until such time that she is old enough to profess her own faith in Jesus Christ? So I know that before she was born, you probably spent a lot of time thinking about what name you would give her. And when we name a child, it says that uh, it gives her an identity and it gives her belonging in your family. The same is true with baptism. When we baptize a child, it identifies her as a child of God and makes it belonging into the community of faith. So it is no light question when I ask you, what name is given this child? All right, Jolene, here we go. You ready for this? Jolene, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, looky here, church. This is the newest, yeah, look, yeah. This is the newest part of our family of God right here. Miss Jolene, Jojo is what they call her. 
You know, we are in covenant with JoJo's parents and her family to help in the raising of this child as her Sunday school teachers, as people who will walk alongside. Here we go, James. People who are going to walk alongside JoJo as she grows up. That's our job as the church. That's our job as the community of faith. And if you are willing to do that, to walk alongside JoJo, to walk alongside JoJo's family, will you please say amen? Amen. Oh, listen to that. This is all your brand new family. Now we're going to come over here and we're going to pray together. We're going to get your parents. You want to come pray too? Come on, Harriet. We're going to lean. We're going to kneel right here. Okay? Okay. Come on, Mom and Dad. Come on, Huck. We're going to, you want to come lay hands on this baby as we pray? Oh, oh, well, it took off the microphone. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Wait. No, that's all right. Okay, she may not let me take her back. So let's pray, church. Almighty God, we ask your blessing to be upon Jolene. Where she grows in years, may she also grow in knowledge and grace of you, Jesus Christ. And so guide and uphold her parents that through wise counsel and loving care and holy example, they may lead her into a life of faith, of righteousness, and strength. This we pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. All right. We did it. We did it. Yeah, now, <laughs> now, you're now you're smiling. All right. Go in peace, family. All right, now we're going to invite all the children to come up for the children's time. So, uh, Miss Emily will join you down here. And... <laughs> Don't jinx it. Um, I was wondering if you guys like my outfit today. You like you like you like it. You like these pants. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, don't hype me up like that. Do I? Uh, do you know that if I'd worn this outfit to this church 20 years ago, I would have gotten some pretty crazy looks <coughs> because women were just being allowed. Wait, no. Oh gosh, no. More like 40 years ago. My bad. I'm not aging. My, <laughs> but 40 years ago. When I, I was really little, I would have gotten some crazy looks because well, I'm wearing what? Pants. Okay. Gia's been wearing some cute pants too. Okay. But, but we, about 40, 50 years ago, we would have gotten some crazy looks, Gia, if we had worn pants to church on Sunday. If we go back farther than that, we wouldn't have been allowed to wear pants, me and Gia. No, that's true. Isn't that crazy? Women were not, there were laws against women wearing pants. I'm serious. Yes, why? For what? There, do you know that in, in the United States and France and England, they sent women to jail for wearing pants? I'm serious. This is true. You can Google it. It's crazy, right? Somewhere a long time ago, there was some reason that women shouldn't wear pants. It wasn't, it wasn't good. It wasn't the deal. And then it just got, this, this ritual, this habit became a law somehow, and nobody said, until about the 1920s, nobody said, why are we not wearing pants? This is crazy. And in, in about the 1920s, things started getting a little bit better, right? Like, we, we were getting, it was more acceptable for women to wear pants. But I want you to think about, there's all kinds of stuff we do today that in 40 or 50 years from now, we're going to be like, can you believe we did that? Oh, my gosh, that was crazy. Because there are habits and rituals that we do today because we've always done them, right? And some of them are important, and some of them are good, but some of them maybe need to change. You ever thought about that? Not brushing your teeth. That's a habit that you need to continue always doing. Okay? Don't, don't get any ideas, Thomas. <laughs> so, but there, there are some things that we do just because everybody else does. And that's something that we need to think about because God wants us to be ourselves 
He wants us to have a relationship with him. He wants us to talk to him and love him and share our life with him. And if we wear pants, even when other people say that's weird and we're not supposed to, he doesn't care. I don't, I don't think he cares. Maybe some people might think he cares if we wear pants. But I think he's more worried about listening to Gia and Harriet and James and Thomas and Adeline. Adelaide, because he wants to know you, and he wants to know your heart. He doesn't care about some of these rituals and habits that we do because we have to, okay? He wants a relationship with you. Let's say a quick prayer. Dear God, thanks for pants, <laughs> and thank you for loving us, thank you for loving us, and wanting a relationship with us, and wanting a relationship with us. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite Alice and Marlo up to speak with us about stewardship. Good morning. My name is Alice and Marlo, and I am uh, part of the leadership committee here at First Methodist. And I've been asked to speak to you as we kick off our fall stewardship campaign. Um, and kind of tell you a little bit of a little bit about my time here. My family joined the church. I guess it was about the mid '80s, which gives away my age a little bit. We were um, attending another church in town, and I had just finished confirmation. We became a part of this church, and I remember our youth group meeting across Jackson Street, where the parking lot and the pumpkin patch sit today. There was a big white house and the youth would meet in it. All of our activities were there. It was big grounds, a tree-shaded lot. The old home kind of had the charm of your grandparents' house. Um, as an adult, I realized it was probably a maintenance nightmare, but we thought it was really warm and fun, and a little bit spooky. Um, that was my first memory here at the church. I grew up in these hallways, attending Sunday school, and um, moved away to go to college, but always came back to this church. I married my husband here, all of my children were baptized here, and we've raised our family in this church as well. I was fortunate years ago to work on the restoration of our building. I know we talked about the glass is finally finished, the stained glass restoration, the organs back in place. Um, every few years, we all have to come together to do things to keep this building going uh, for the future generations. When I think about all of my memories, they're tied to these buildings. And it makes sense, I'm an architect. That's what I've studied in school. I mentored in a firm here, Baron Heinberg and Bricado, and under Tilo Steinschulte, who some of you may remember, he was an old timer, a fantastic guy. Um, he gave me a four leaf clover during that summer here that I still carry in my wallet. He was a fantastic guy with um, amazing background. And then I later learned, actually painted the Last Supper that sits in the back of the um, sanctuary today. So I invite you to look at that on your way out. All of us contribute to this church. Um, it's really about the family. The buildings are our physical structure, but it's the people inside that matter. And that's what keeps us here and keeps us coming back. So as we embark upon the stewardship time, Think about how you contribute to this church. It would just be empty buildings without us. So each one of you is so important um, to give not only of your gifts, but your time. We're working on planning the future years, our missions calendar, all of the different activities. If there's something you want to be involved in or some crazy idea you think we should embark upon, let us know. We would love to have you be a bigger part of this church and our church family. So thank you for having us here. As we watched that baptism, so many of us, um, we probably might not remember our baptism, but the intentions that we all felt when we prayed for that baby, someone once felt them for you. I don't know what you plan to be when you grow up. Did anyone have any uh, big goals when they were a kid? Renita said that she uh, originally planned to be a lawyer. I think Chris, what did you say? 
president. How stressful would that have been around now? Uh, I know I wanted to be a clown. So God adjusts our paths for his good, and he does that by changing us from deep within ourselves. It's a miracle when a person changes. And sometimes that is how we glorify God with the way we live, when we adjust our attitude, when we make sure that everything that comes out of us is for good and for service. That's what God needs from us. And the beautiful thing about the God we serve is you can be reconciled to him in an instant. You can be baptized in any age. You can be renewed at any moment because he is good. Let us pray. God, in the scripture today, we will hear about what makes a person good or bad. It comes from within. And so we ask that you continue your work in us. Your work in us is never done. So help us to not give up. Help us to not become cynical because the world is cynical. Help us to see ourselves and the people around us the way you see us as servants and as people who love one another. Make us more in love with you so that we can change. In Christ's name we pray and sing. Amen.
As we come to our time of prayer, just a few people we want to mention today. We we're going to mention Declan Murphy, that if he does not behave, he's going to find himself in the nursery. Declan, you got that? He's got that. We also want to pray for B. Jeter. She's in the hospital. I uh, got to see her yesterday, and uh, she is doing well. And uh, she's, she says, I love my church. And she says, send them my regards. And so uh, prayers for her continued health and healing. And then we have a few birthdays. Uh, last week I was out, and uh, these people had birthdays without me. Uh, Mike Hislop, uh, Steve Berry, uh, Wayne Tut and uh, Simon Follett. So uh, we wish them happy birthday. Tomorrow is Nanette Walton's birthday. And then uh, Rhonda Atwood and Mary Hathorne have birthdays on Tuesday, right? Yes. And then Gary Follett has a birthday on Friday. So we praise God for your life and your life among us. So let us pray. God of grace and God of mercy, as we come into this place of worship this morning, tear down all that distracts us from hearing you, from feeling you, from being with you. Make our worship genuine and heartfelt so that we are not just honoring you with our lips, but with our whole selves. Let not our hearts be troubled, or for that matter, let not our hearts be far from you. Take from us all those things that get in the way of our relationship with you. Our pride, our self-reliance, our doubt, our fear, our need for control, and replace it, Lord, with your spirit deep within us. Help us to take the time to reach out to our neighbor, even if we are busy and tired. Help us to tear down walls when we would much rather let them stand. Stretch us into service. Challenge us beyond our comfort zone. Rally us to risk it all for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of your mission, so that all will know that we are your children, your disciples, and not by just what we say, but also by what we do. This we pray in the name of Jesus who taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So as we embark on this big journey, taking a small step, first it's about relationship. And what better passage to help us with that than Mark 7? I'll be reading around the chapter just a little bit, but starting at verse 1. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. And saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For you see, the Pharisees and all of the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they had come from the marketplace, they did not eat unless they washed their hands. And they observed many other traditions, such as washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the traditions of the elders 
instead of eating their food with defiled hands. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesies about you hypocrites, as it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teaching are merely human rules. You have to let go of the commands of God. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Verse 14. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and he said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. Verse 21, for it is from within, out of a person, heart that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside a person. That's what defiles them. Let us pray. Almighty God, still the busyness of our minds and open our hearts to you that we may hear your word for us this day. Amen. Well, all of us have traditions, right? Different kinds of family traditions that we uh, all practice. Uh, some of them are funny. Some of them are sentimental. We have a little sentimental, I guess, tradition. If you've noticed my baptismal stole this morning, uh, we had a little tradition before each one of the grandkids was baptized, and I got to baptize them. We put their feet uh, we stamped their feet on the eve of their baptism on the stole. And you can see from Liam's that we were very careful to make sure you could tell it was a foot. By the time we got to Blake, we just slapped it on there, and we were lucky to have it done. You know, so traditions are kind of funny. They, they, uh, they make us a family. We have another tradition that, that uh, we call dancing around the birthday tree. Dancing around the birthday tree. Anyone want to guess what that means? When you dance around a birthday tree, even Blake doesn't know yet what that means. Not enough birthdays. It means we go home and we open presents. So, but if you're new to our family, like a son-in-law, you know, and we say we go out to dinner and we're celebrating Heather's birthday, and we say, okay, let's go home and dance around the birthday tree, my son-in-law literally thought, oh my goodness, we're about to go home and hold hands and, you know, do some kind of grapevine dance around some tree they have at their house, you know, and he was just mortified that he was going to have to get up and dance in front of this brand new family he had come into. But we all have different kinds of traditions. Uh, family traditions, uh, if you are ever uh, in Opelousas on a Friday, you're going to want to join uh, Chris and Jean Sanders because their family tradition is to eat homemade apple pie that Chris has made uh, with his mother-in-law. Now, I, I kind of like that. I want to become a Sanders and uh, have that uh, tradition. We have holiday traditions. You know, some of us make sure we go to Christmas Eve service or you have certain foods that you prepare for a Christmas dinner. We do, and in certain, they have to all go in certain bowls or certain containers. I mean, it's the same every year. Maybe you have sports traditions like the Ard family. Lurleen and her family have watched every single LSU game, no matter the season, no matter the sport. And, and uh, they, they will now call each other uh, during the game so they can, uh, you know, see what's going on. After uh, Jeff passed away, her son Mike came up to see the next LSU game with his mom to make sure, you know, that tradition continued. Maybe you have sports traditions about where a certain jersey. You have a lucky jersey. I have red, I have red shoes that I wear to every one of Liam's baseball games because they're the lucky red shoes. My mother-in-law had a, I don't know, I don't know why she was a Cowboys fan. There is no accounting for taste. Um, I still married, I still married her son. Uh, but uh, she had this certain chair in her kitchen that you could not sit in because if you sat in that chair, 
the Cowboys would lose. So, I mean, she'd say, get out of that chair, get out of that chair. You know, so we all have kinds of traditions. And then there's fun family-making traditions. Uh, the Swan family likes to make gingerbread houses every year. And then uh, the Miller family, Natalie, I, I heard about this, uh, that y'all have a tradition of uh, s'mores and dance parties in your outdoor kitchen. So, uh, yeah, that sounds like fun. Next time you have a dance party, uh, Miss R.L. wants to come. But traditions are powerful. Traditions are meaningful. They, they shape us. They, they bond us with our family. They bring us together in different ways. And as we heard in Scripture... This morning, the Pharisees were all about their traditions, especially their religious traditions. And in fact, they had substituted their religious rituals, their religious traditions, for a meaningful relationship with a living God. So let's take a closer look at Scripture this morning. The Pharisees had come down from Jerusalem. They had made, probably walked a day's journey uh, just so they could lay their judgy eyes on Jesus and his disciples. They'd, and when the disciples came in from a long day of preaching and teaching and healing, well, they were hungry. So they immediately uh, sat down to the table, kind of this grab it and growl moment, and began to eat their eat their meal. And, uh, you know, they didn't think much of it. They didn't think about the, the fact that they had not washed their hands, but the Pharisees were absolutely mortified, mortified that the disciples, uh, these good little Jewish boys, you know, had seemed to be walking away from their faith because they sit down to the table and they did not practice the ceremonial hand washing that they were supposed to do. Now, it, it went something a little like this. They had a, a bowl or a cup, probably something a little bit smaller than this, uh, but it had two handles on each side. And what, what they were supposed to do was dip it in the water twice and pour it over the right hand or left hand, the other right hand, and then they would dip it in the water again and twice pour over the other hand. And, and that was a ceremonial hand washing. And at the same time, they would say this little blessing while they poured the water over their hands. They would say, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your commandments and commended, and commanded us concerning the washing of our hands. Now, here's the real kicker. This had nothing to do with God. This little ceremonial hand-washing bit with the blessing, you know, it's kind of like singing uh, happy birthday when you wash your hands. Anybody do that? Just me? You know, washing your hands, making sure you'd wash them long enough. That's all that was. That's all that was, to make sure that they had done it, you know, four times, two times on each side. Uh, but, but here's the thing. The Pharisees had equated the disciples not washing their hands, basically, to uh, committing adultery or not honoring your mother and your father. You see, uh, they had equated it to God's rules, but this wasn't God's rule. This was man's rule. This is something that the Pharisees had made up. This was man's law, not God's law, to wash your hands. So no wonder Jesus stuck up for the Pharisees. I mean, he got all crunk on them because they were, he was, you know, giving them, his disciples, a hard time. And Jesus says, don't. Don't do that. He says, you remind me of the hypocrites. And then he goes on to to quote what the prophet Isaiah said. He says, these people, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You have let go of the commands of God, and you are holding on to human traditions. Isaiah said that. Jesus reminded them. They were all about man's law, not God's law. In other words, Jesus was trying to remind them and us don't let rituals like hand-washing become your religion. 
Don't let rituals become your religion because it's not about what's on the outside that matters. It's about what's on the inside. Because if the insides are dirty, everything else you do is going to be dirty. That's what it was all about. It's not about the ritual. So my friend James Swanson, he's now a bishop in the United Methodist Church, but before he was a bishop, he was a regular old preacher like me. And he and I were in the doctoral program together at SMU, and so that's where we met. And one day in class we were talking about, or after class, we were talking about this, pa this particular passage. And he had just preached on uh, Mark 7, and he was telling me how he got his church all riled up. He's an African-American uh, preacher, and so in his church, you know, he would, he would get into this kind of rhythm, you know, in his preaching, and we'd get everybody all riled up, and, and he'd be talking about, you know, hey, the Pharisees, it was all about the law, and people would stand up and start shouting and go, hey, man, yeah, and they'd be cheering. He says, but it's not about the law, and they'd say, no, not about the law. He says, it's, it's not about the ritual, and they'd be cheering, no, it's not about the ritual. He says, it's about your heart. Yeah, it's about your heart. He says, yeah, your heart's got to be clean, He's, and then he'd start just spouting some nonsense in the middle of it. He says, and my hair's on fire, you know, and, but it's about, it's not about the ritual. It's about your heart, but my hair's on fire, and they'd be cheering and clapping and he says and the dog is at the door you know he just all these random things and they're just getting all in this frenzy well all of a sudden James stops and he gets real quiet and he says you haven't heard a word I've said he says, you've gotten all excited about, about being here in church you've gotten all worked up over the word but you haven't heard the word he says, you've gotten all, you know, you, you know that you think that this is how church is supposed to go. All the shouting and the crying and the cheering and the amen. And he, he says, it's not about that. He says, it's about your relationship with God. You know, those folks in his church, good people. They were in the right place, but they were doing the wrong thing. They were cheering his sermon, but they were not listening to the lesson. It's kind of like we think, well, you know, by sitting in the pews, we're going to become a Christian, just like if we were sitting in our garage, we might become a car. You know, I, now, don't get me wrong, I'm glad you're here. We couldn't do church if you weren't here. But being here is more than just sitting in the pews. Being here is about being in community. Being here is about building your relationship. Your one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. We don't do the prayers or sing the songs just because we're supposed to. It's because we want to take in the words of the song to, to feed our soul because some of us are fed through music. We pray the prayers or we say the creeds because those words are meaningful for us. My favorite one, we didn't do it today, but it's the one from Romans 8 because it reminds me every time we say it that there is nothing, 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 nothing that can, celebra can separate us from the love of God through Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. I mean, that, just, that is so powerful and so meaningful to me, and perhaps you have an affirmation of faith that is meaningful for you. That's why we do it, not because we're supposed to or because we have to, but because it brings meaning to the living relationship that we are to have with Jesus Christ as his disciples. That's Jesus' concern as well. That's what he wants from us. He doesn't want us to worry about how clean our hands are. He's not worried about that. What Jesus is worried about is how clean our heart is. He's not talking about if you've got plaque buildup or high blood pressure. That's not his concern. Well, it might be. But he's worried about what's on the inside. Is it evil? Is it immoral? Is it, you know, causing you to do the wrong things instead of the right things? It's what's on the inside that matters, not what's on the outside. You know, we live in a culture, though, that's totally opposite of that. We live in a culture where we look judgy at people. We give judgy side eye to people who are overweight. You know, we roll our eyes to those that uh, might have different colored hair or uh, dress kind of funny. 
or different, you know, have a, kind of a, uh, an expressive clothing style. We give the cold shoulder to the one with all the tattoos or body piercings, and we barely, barely make eye contact with the homeless on the street corner. You know, we will make a split-second decision about somebody based on how they look. But Jesus reminds us it's not about how we look. It, it's not what's on the outside that is important. It's not about clean hands. It's about a clean heart. Here's what God wants from us more than anything. He wants deeds over creeds. He wants love over law. He wants heart over habit. He wants what we do on the outside to match how we are on the inside. Or as my daddy would say, purdy is as purdy does. P-U-R-D-Y, purdy. Purdy is as purdy does. So my friend Garbus, he was in my first church that I served down in New Orleans. Now Garbus uh, came, I don't know how, well, how old he was when he came to the United States, but he grew up in Armenia, had a thick Armenian accent, uh, and, uh, but he became an American citizen and loved the fact that he was an American citizen. In fact, on the Sunday closest to the 4th of July, he would always come to church dressed head to toe, top hat, to, to toe in an Uncle Sam's uh, costume, I guess. And then sometime in the middle of the worship service, usually during the anthem, because it was a patriotic anthem, he'd stand up and he'd say, God bless America. You know, one day he knocked on our front door and because uh, we lived right next door to the church and he thanked Rusty and I both for driving American-made cars. I can't even tell you what kind we had. I had a red one. He, Rusty had a green one. That's what kind of car we had. And, uh, but, but apparently they were American-made and he, he was just so pleased that you know his pastor and pastoral family were driving American-made cars. That's how much he appreciated it. Now, Garbus made a good living, but you'd never know it. Uh, he was a medical photographer, uh, so he had a good salary. But one time he invited us over to his house, the four of us, uh, for dinner. And when you walk in, you see how sparsely uh, appointed his apartment was. He had, uh, you know, one couch, one little, you know, one little love seat, one chair, one lamp. He had one little table and, and two chairs, and, and that, that was about it as far as the living room. And when we came for dinner, uh, we, we sat on the couch and, and we ate in our laps because there just, you know, there wasn't room at the table for all five of us to, to sit. And it wasn't because he was, I mean, he was frugal, but it wasn't because he was cheap. It was because what Garbus did was that he gave the rest of his money away. He, in the wintertime, he would buy blankets for the homeless, and he wouldn't just run over to the shelter and ask, ask him to pass that out. You know, here, pass these out to anyone that needs a blanket. No, Garbus would go out into the community of New Orleans and the highways and the byways and under bridges and in dark alleys you know, places I would not necessarily go in the daytime, he would go in the nighttime, and he would pass out these blankets, and he'd say, God loves you, and so does Garbus. God loves you, and so does Garbus. And that's how he lived his life, giving, giving what he had away. Uh, he would also serve hot soup from the trunk of his car. He had these big vats like you might fry turkey in or fix jambalaya in, and he would just just make soup and and we would go a couple of times I would go with him and we would we would just go to the places where the homeless were in New Orleans and they knew his car he would honk his horn and they would just come out from the cracks in the walls and they would line up and we would serve them hot soup one time we got run off by the police and, and he says, just meet me around the corner. And so we got in the car and we drove around the corner out of the side of the police and opened up the trunk and went back to serving soup because that's just who Garbus was. You know, and, and, uh, and, and they loved him and they he was probably the safest person in all of New Orleans because they knew that Garbus was authentic. Garbus didn't do anything to prove a point 
He did it because he cared, and they knew it. And so uh, wherever, whatever dark alley he was in, you know, nobody, nobody was going to do Garbus any harm. They were going to protect him. Garbus wasn't a do-gooder. Garbus just did good because that's how he was, inside and out. You know, that's what Jesus is looking for for all of his disciples. He's looking for us to be a Garbus as well. He's not looking for big rituals or fancy prayers or anything like that. What Jesus really wants is for us to have a genuine, authentic relationship with him. That's it. That's it. And all it takes is one small step. That step, love God. Love God with all your heart. That's it. That's the first step. And when we love God, it changes everything. It changes how we think. It changes how we act. It changes how we live. It changes how we give. It changes what we do. It changes how we treat people. It changes how we see people. It changes how we speak to people. It, it changes everything. One small step. One small step. Love God. When we can take that one small step, it opens up a big journey ahead. I'm excited for you to take that one small step. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask you to come into our hearts this day, infiltrate every part of our being so that all that we do, all that comes out of us, is motivated by our love for you. This we pray in your name. Amen. Well, there are some great ways that we can connect into the life of the church. I invite you after this worship service to go across the street. Uh, the pumpkin patch is open. This is our last day, unless we don't quite sell all of our pumpkins today. But there's going to be pony rides. Oh, yeah, the front row's getting real excited now. Pony rides, there's live music, there's inflatables, there's a food truck over there, and oh, yeah, there's pumpkins, too. So, uh, you know, just enjoy. The, it's, we've had the greatest weather we could possibly have this weekend. So go and enjoy your church family. Enjoy the pumpkin patch. Go have lunch over there and just enjoy it all. Be, enjoy being outside. Uh, also, October 31st, we are uh, doing a new thing called Young at Heart. We are partnering with the Jewish Temple and we're going to have activities back and forth between uh, the, two, uh, the two places of worship. So this time we will be at the Jewish temple. You can meet there at 10 o'clock. We'll have lunch. We're going to play some bingo. Or you can meet me here at 945 and we'll carpool and caravan over there together. So I hope you'll put that on your calendar. Speaking of marking your count calendar. November the 3rd is our volunteer appreciation lunch. So if you have uh, been a communion steward, if you sing in the choir, if you have taught, if you have ushed, if you have prayed, if you have volunteered to do anything, I want you to come. Let your staff appreciate you with a beautiful catered meal uh, November the 3rd. To, to the, so that's in two weeks. So it'll be after this worship service. And then our uh, United uh, Women in Faith uh, are doing a casserole sale. November 20th, and uh, so one, it's a great opportunity to stock up your freezer, or two, if you would like to help, uh, the containers that they're putting them all in is uh, over by the coffee and donuts in the welcome area, and so uh, you are welcome, all the instructions that you need are all there, and you can help participate in that. Other things on the insert, on the calendar, come join us. Best way to connect, though, is to make this church your church, and if you're ready to do that, I'd love to invite you to come forward as we sing our closing hymn or just sing for the worship service. Elizabeth? Our closing hymn today can be found in your red hymnals, number 370, Victory in Jesus, number 370. Please stand and sing with us. came from glory 
How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ever I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to about his healing of his cleansing power revealing how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see and then i cried dear jesus come and heal my broken spirit to me the victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood he loved me ere i knew him now all my love is me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels sing the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his redeeming he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Thank you all for being here this morning, especially our guests. Thank you for coming to celebrate this baptism especially and just being here to worship our Lord and Savior together. And now go forth, go forth from this place uh, to love God, to love others from the inside out where you work, where you play, and where you live. And may the peace of God be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.